Well, not that he could ever really be great, you understand. Oh, is that so? And in the name of St. Bridget, why not? Well, all of the really great cornet players were Irish. You shouldn't hang me on a hook. My father hung me on a hook once. Once. A, B, C. A, always, B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. See that one? Uh, hi, I'm Mark, and this is the Cinemaniacs, or Cinemaniac, actually. Tom's on vacation. He's, he's hooping it up somewhere where there's trees and probably sand and air and things. And I figured, why deprive you, our singular devoted viewer, uh, from hearing what, at least, frankly, I have to say about what came out on video, on film last week and on video this week. So uh, here I am to fill some space in our schedule and in your lonely, lonely life. And let's start off with the latest from uh, Universal, I believe, continuing their climb on the high road to intelligent and thought-provoking and, and, and tender stories, including this one about a couple who are lacking spice in the bedroom. So Cameron Diaz and Jason Siegel decide <laughs> to make a sex tape. Hi, uh, yeah, you'll never know how much editing I just did in the trailer you didn't just see. Uh, hey, so uh, what is left of that trailer uh, should give you an idea of the level of class and, and uh, uh, you know, contemplation that this film uh, contains. So you know, out, of the, out of the gate, you know, this is gonna be fairly, a fairly crude enterprise. Uh, and that's fine, you know, I'm no prude, as I'm a fan of saying on the show, you look at my DVD collection and that'll make it pretty clear that I'm not a prude, but, you know, when all you have is crude bodily function jokes and you think it's cute that people do cocaine, I gotta have a beef with your movie. Uh, so that stuff aside, it's not very funny. Uh, at first, this was one of those movies where I laughed to myself when it started because I turned around and I realized I was the only person in the theater. And to be fair, you know, a weekend Saturday show at noon, that's probably not gonna be that busy, but ultimately there were a few other people there at the, the screening that I went to. And I heard a couple laughs throughout the movie from the three other people that were there, but it just, it's not that funny. And I thought that this would probably be kind of a madcap screwball, have to get the object back before everybody sees it kind of movie. And there's a bit of that, but there's not as much of that as I thought there would be. I thought that most of the running time would be these people scrambling around town trying to you know, outrun the internet and things like that. And there's a little of that, but not much. It kind of spends a lot of time at uh, one location where it's just kind of very repetitive and just not very funny. So I didn't really get much out of sex tape. I mean, if you follow the PR machine on this, Cameron Diaz is naked in the movie. That's a big thing they're pushing. And I guess when you don't have comedy, you push the fact that one of your stars is naked in a movie. Uh, and yes, you see her rear view and you see a side view briefly, but I don't know if that's worth spending eight or 10 bucks for, unless this is something you've been waiting to see since you, know, you saw The Mask all those years ago. Uh, so I really can't recommend sex tape, even as like a throwaway comedy, maybe as a rental, but as a movie to see in the theater, uh, there's, well, I don't even want to say there's better comedies because the other comedy at Keen Cinemas is Tammy, and that's certainly not a really good alternative. As a good alternative to sex tape, I would say go see Dawn of the Planet of the Apes because at least it's cool. Uh, so, speaking of comedies, up next, uh, see, there's, you're lacking the witty banter we have here. All I can do is talk to myself, and, and that gets old and or disturbing after a while. Up next, we have a sequel to a, a surprisingly popular uh, thriller from a couple of years ago. Uh, this is a, fa a future America where all crime, uh, the crime rate is down very low because one day a year for 12 hours, all crime is legal and everybody locks themselves up in their houses and tries to stay in and not fall victim to the purge, anarchy. So, so much for surprises. Uh, I had actually not seen any trailers or anything for this movie before going to see it. I just knew that there was another purge movie. So I went into it expecting more of the same. It starts off, you're following this uh, Hispanic woman and her family in a sort of a, 
I don't know if it's a lower class, but not rich like the people were in the first movie, apartment. And I just figured, okay, so the, the second purge is going to be the same thing, but it's going to be people defending their home in a lower class neighborhood as opposed to an upper class neighborhood, which is what we saw in the first film. The first purge was really a home invasion slash siege movie. And I have to give the purge anarchy credit because it's not the same thing all over again, which would have been really easy to do. This actually, it opens up the world of the purge, so to speak. And it's really about a bunch of people, individuals who get trapped outside and are defenseless while this is going on. And, and just people are running riot in the streets, committing all kinds of heinous acts. And they're trying to find a way to get from point A to point B to safety and survive. Now, the trailer actually shows you, as too many trailers do, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. And here's a shot of something that might be the end of the movie. Uh, so I was surprised where this movie went. But for me, I, the first Purge I had a big problem with because every time anything happened, it was the, sh you've, you've heard this from me before, the shot too close, camera too shaky, edited too fast, and you just can't tell what's going on, and in the dark. Uh, this movie is a little bit better than that in terms of visual comprehensibility, but again, when anything is going down, it's just a mess and you can't really see what's going on. So you might as well look away and then when the noise level subsides, you can see who's left standing and apparently they won that fight. Uh, so basically it starts off, it's kind of like Mad Max where you see uh, Frank Grillo plays this character who's prowling the streets for revenge and winds up hooking up and being the protector of everybody else. So there's kind of like Mad Max there. It's kind of like Escape from New York in a way. It reminded me of The Wanderers in a way. And then as that twist that the trailer gives away toward the end, it becomes a lot like, let's say, this one or the first or second Hostel movie, or it's one of the people at Keen Cinema said it felt like it was The Hunger Games. So it felt really derivative to me. I mean, it, it was interesting, but I sat there wondering, uh, I believe another Universal film, I wonder, why is this in theaters? Because it's not so cinematic that it warrants being in theaters. Uh, I don't think there was much of a budget to this, and it, it, I don't want to say it shows in a negative way. I'm impressed with what they did with the budget because I'm realizing this isn't an expensive movie, and I'm buying that this town is deserted, and they shot it somewhere in, like, L.A. or something. So they managed to do it a, a budgeted version of, you know, shutting off a section of a few streets, and it looks like it's totally devoid of any life. So ultimately, I thought it was a little dull. Personally, uh, the folks I talked to at Keen Cinemas liked it a lot better. They were younger, so they they probably weren't seeing the similarities between other older, better movies that I was seeing and would have preferred to be watching. Really, um, this kind of interesting, as I said, in that it expands the world of the Purge. It gets behind the who's and the why's a little bit more, and it also weaves in a whole lot of wealth inequality, one percent occupy kind of philosophy into it, which in my mind. It, it makes it slightly more interesting, but also kind of sets up where I'm sure the third movie is going to go, uh, which uh, coincidentally is also kind of how The Last Hunger Games ended, so there's more parallels there. But um, I would say if you liked The First Purge, you'd like this, but it is kind of a different movie, and it really felt like the kind of thing that would have or maybe should have gone straight to video. Like The First Purge had Ethan Hawke and some people you would recognize in it, and Frank Grillo is the most recognizable person in this one who's not terribly recognizable, and uh, an actor who was on uh, Boardwalk Empire you might recognize was in it playing the leader of like the resistance. Uh, but uh, otherwise it seemed pretty kind of inconsequential to me. Uh, so you know, make, make of that what you will. Some people like stuff that I don't and vice versa, so hey. Uh, so speaking of, actually literally speaking of something that's fun for the whole family, I actually went from the film I'm about to talk about directly into the one that I just talked about, and you want to talk about a grinding loud gear shift? Uh, it's like throwing the car into reverse. Uh, up next, we have Disney's latest uh, release of a Pixar, I think, film. All of your favorite uh, talking uh, air devices are back in Planes, Fire and Rescue. Okay, I have to admit that uh, the moment that I laughed out loud first and maybe loudest in the film was a fart joke involving a plane and a forklift. Uh, which generally, I, generally it bugs me that all kids' films feel like they have to be rectally fixated, and it seems like you're really, really reaching for that all-important rectal fixation in a kids' movie when it's about things that don't even have a, a rear end, technically. There's all these, like, there's not a lot, so it, it just disappointed me that they had to really, really use the uh, jaws of life to get those uh, rectal jokes in in a film about pieces of machinery. But uh, I didn't see the previous Planes film because I didn't have to, frankly. And I had heard from everybody that it wasn't any good. Uh, in, in no uncertain terms, I was told by one of the staff at Keen Cinemas that the first film wasn't good. And I really actually kind of like this one 
I had a really good time with this movie, and it surprised me because I, I never saw the original Cars. I saw the sequel, which I really didn't like, and, and this seemed like it was going to be really aimed at little tots, which I think is probably the best audience for it. But uh, it, the trailer g gave away something that I didn't realize in the film is that basically the story of this film is that the plane Dusty, the plane who is the main star of Planes, has to go off and train to be a, a fire fire plane, fire and rescue plane with this elite team of wilderness fire and rescue people like out in the Pacific mid, mid, Pacific Northwest somewhere. And uh, he gets there and the alarm is sounded and they go off to fight a forest fire to the tune of ACDC's Thunderstruck, which I didn't know was going to happen. So if you would have told me before I went in that I would be sitting in a theater watching a Disney film about talking planes where a kick-ass fire uh, rescue was shot and edited to the tune of Thunderstruck uh, and that there'd be a little kid clapping along during that sequence in the theater, I, I'm not sure I would have believed you. But uh, that really made me smile in a pretty big way. I was really kind of grooving to this at that point. And that really it won me over from there on out. Um, it's predominantly for little kids, but there are jokes in here for adults that no little kid is ever going to get. And, they're, and some of them are crude, which kind of disappointed me that they felt they needed to put that in there. Uh, like, you know, a, a truck or a plane basically saying a swear but replacing the, the money word with, uh, you know, Chevy or something like that. That just seemed unnecessary. But there's a reference to a certain 70s policeman on motorcycles show that uh, was really well done in this movie. And it had me giggling and smiling and laughing out loud. And they even got voice casting of one of the co-stars of that show in it. And I don't want to give it away if you are going to see this because it was a pretty out of nowhere surprise for me. And uh, the voice cast is really good in this. People like... Uh, Jerry Stiller and Ann Mira, the old comedy team, are in this as a pair of elderly married Winnebago couple. And stuff like that. It wasn't like distracting that I knew who the voices were, but when I realized who they had cast, it kind of made me smile. Like Curtis Armstrong from For Me Better Off Dead or, or uh, Revenge of the Nerds or, or Moonlighting had a, a character voice. And it was just cool to see, hear him in a movie again. So I like Planes, Fire, and Rescue. It's not very long. It's about 90 minutes or so. It doesn't outstay its welcome. Uh, the kids in the audience seem to like it quite a bit. And uh, I think parents probably would too in this case. So of the three I saw in the theater, much to my surprise, Planes, Fire, and Rescue is the one that I would recommend and the one I would probably be willing to sit through again if I was at a drive-in with something new that I wanted to see. So uh, we thank our friends at Keen Cinemas for uh, providing uh, these movies for us and for everybody else out there, nice folks. and. Uh, I, like I've said, I enjoy going even if I don't enjoy the movie because uh, the picture and sound are really good there. And I probably shouldn't be repeating this this far into the fact that they've done this for like a year or more, but boy, it wasn't the case for a long time. Uh, speaking of, of thanking people, we now roll on and thank our friends at Video Headquarters for the following, which I'm about to discuss, which are released this Tuesday, or if you're, as we like to say, if you're watching this show after Tuesday, they're uh, available now. Uh, first up is Johnny Depp in a, a, a thinking person's sci-fi film. What do you do when you're terminally ill and your wife decides to take all of your conscience and stuff it in a computer? Uh, you hope it's running, not running Windows 98. Uh, you seek and yearn and hope for transcendence. So I'm a big fan of teaser trailers in general because they tend to just give you a glimpse, a taste of what the movie's about, and then you, know, you go to the movie to find out what the story is. And... Um, I put these shows on YouTube, and for some reason YouTube doesn't want me to have, or us to have trailers embedded in the video that we put on, so I have to cut the trailers out for YouTube. So if you ever watch this show on YouTube, it's almost, a, in a sense, a better way to experience it, because that trailer gave away things that are probably better that you don't know when you're going in to see this movie. And anyway, um, so I went into this movie not knowing anything. I knew that it was about artificial intelligence, and Johnny Depp was in it, and that was about it. And I think if you go into this thinking you're going to get a Johnny Depp movie where you can kind of swoon over Johnny Depp for the duration, or if this is typical current contemporary sci-fi, which is basically an action movie with lasers and jetpacks and things blowing up, you're going to be disappointed. And this movie tanked in the box office, and most people I've read their opinions of on the movie didn't like it. But I guess I'm on the opposite side, because I really like this a lot. I liked it because it was a thinking person sci-fi. It's what it's what sci-fi like writing used to be and what sci-fi movies occasionally used to be, which was taking current technology or technology that we're right on the cusp of having and extrapolating on where that could go. And it's, you know, it's like speculative fiction as opposed to just, you know, an action movie. And if you see the trailer, there's explosions and there are laser beams and things like that. But that's such a small part of what this movie is. It's really about somebody who's a genius with computers and 
next level AI and the internet and all those sorts of things. And he develops a terminal illness. So you get to see Johnny Depp rock that sexy, balding terminal illness look in this film for the brief period that he's actually in it. He's actually represented as a, a, a computer generated face likeness on a computer screen more than he's actually a physical person walking around. But I thought this was really thoughtful and intelligent and, and touching and meaningful, which is more than, again, most sci-fi movies are these days. And it was just neat. And the, the effects were really good with the limited use of effects that they had. And again, he, he's, um, his consciousness is basically copied and put into this computer and it raises these questions of, is it him or is it a computer? And is the computer self-aware and doing its own thing? Or is it truly his intelligence that's motivating all this? And I don't know, I thought it was really good. And again, this is sold on the strength of Johnny Depp's mug. So the box cover is going to be this huge picture of a good looking Johnny Depp. And that's not what you get in here. Uh, so be aware of that. It's like selling the 80s version of The Fly with a sexy picture of Jeff Goldblum. You don't get that for the whole movie. Uh, so I would recommend Transcendence if you are understanding and, and open to something a little bit smarter than your usual sci-fi movie. That's my take on it. Uh, Tom's take? Eh, he's not here. Uh, so, speaking of uh, films with actors in them, up next, uh, what do you do when you are the struggling pastor of a small town church in the middle of Nebraska, your son has a near-death experience and starts to tell everybody that heaven is for real. Uh, going into this wondering, you know, is this gonna be a sort of a preachy, heavy-handed, one-sided film like the recent film that we saw in the theater, God's Not Dead, which I think comes out on video coincidentally like next week, so we'll be talking about that next week. Uh, I was going and thinking this was going to be heavy-handed and one-sided and preachy, and religious movies, if you're not like super religious, tend to be just kind of cheesy. Uh, but this wasn't. This was actually really well made, beautifully shot. I mean, the, the, the bigger your TV, the better this is going to work. You get a lot of really lovely shots of, of you know, vistas of, of uh, farmland in, in the Midwest and in Nebraska and things like that. And uh, it's interesting, because it's not what I thought it would be. This is about Greg Kinnear struggling with whether or not, being a, a, a pastor of a church, whether or not he believes that his son really went to heaven, he starts questioning what he's supposed to believe in, which I thought was kind of gutsy for what I thought this movie was going to be like. Um, everyone in it is quite good. It's a really strong cast, uh, especially Kinnear and uh, Thomas Hayden Church as a, as a friend of his and sort of this, the different people in the community. And uh, <laughs> My favorite part in the movie is, again, kind of taking the low road, but uh, there's a scene where Greg Kinnear has a kidney stone and he's in the bathroom and you hear these, <laughs> these agonized screams while he's trying to pass a kidney stone that I can only equate to what it sounded like in the old Tom and Jerry cartoons when Jerry would whack Tom on the tail with a hammer. Uh, it was intended to be funny in the movie. I mean, it wasn't, I'm not being cruel or anything here, but it was pretty good. Um, ultimately, the film kind of answers the question for the audience or for, in terms of the story. And it, it gets a little cheesy and, and a little um, cliche toward the end of it, but uh, it, it was better experience than I thought it would be. I think if you're a religious person, you'll certainly enjoy this. And if you're not, you probably ultimately won't. And, uh, but if you're forced to watch it, it's, it there, there's a lot worse films like this you could sit through, uh, God's Not Dead being the one I'm thinking of. Uh, so moving on to the next film we have here, so closely thematically tied. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and a band of, um, I can't recall, FBI, a SWAT team, uh, military police type people pull off a heist that goes awry and then one by one find themselves getting picked off. So what do you do when someone on your team is engaged in sabotage? I've never been one who thought uh, stuff blowing up and a number of bullets fired is proportional to how good a movie is, uh, despite what some trailers think they're appealing to. Uh, so I'm a big fan of Commando, okay? So the, the ground level here is I'm not above Schwarzenegger just laying waste to a lot of people with just the, the biggest gun he can carry. But that's really not what you get with this movie. The trailer sells it as an action movie, but it's not. There's a little bit of action at the beginning and there's a little bit at the end, but really this is about I really, it made, reminded me of the first Lethal Weapon where this team of guys from Nam, or I can't recall, people are getting picked off and somebody gets scared and tries to solve this before they get picked off. And that's really what this is. This is more of a, this is really almost more of a mystery than it is anything else. Um, and I have to say, it's really like disgustingly gory. Like, I like horror movies and stuff, but this is like almost just mean-spirited and nasty. This the, the way people are killed in this and how gruesome it is and how, you know, somebody, gets somebody's 
chasing, excuse me, car chase through a city street and a person on a 10 speed gets whacked bloodily against somebody's windshield and it's just brushed off like it's not a big thing or like it's, like it's supposed to be funny. And it was really gross and kind of disturbing. And Schwarzenegger is, however old and tired he looks in the trailer, that's what you get for the majority of the film. And toward the end, you get him firing a machine gun during a chase scene and then you get, which felt really tacked on, and then you get another thing at the end where he's enacting revenge for something that happened to him earlier in his past. And it really feels like the movie should be over, but it feels like this is in here because maybe test audiences weren't happy that they didn't see Schwarzenegger killing enough people in this movie. Uh, this is really not good. It's a pretty bad movie. Um, and, you know, Expendables came out and everybody went nuts for that. And seriously, like every movie the guys in The Expendables have done that has been spun off by the success of The Expendables has been bad. I can't think of any of them that have been good. Schwarzenegger's done several, Stallone's done several, and they're all pretty much crap. Really, seriously, if you want modern Schwarzenegger, the best thing I've seen him in is Expendables 2, because he's actually in that one. Uh, and if you want classic Schwarzenegger, watch classic Schwarzenegger. He's really kind of too old to be doing this, and it, it doesn't, feel, doesn't feel right anymore. Uh, so I would say, unless you really want to see the people who are in this movie, you know, swear a lot and be kind of greasy looking, I'd probably skip Sabotage and go with something a little classier, class, classicer and better. Uh, so that's all I have for what Video Headquarters gave me, but I'm not done yet, so excuse me oh, while well, I whip that out. Uh, the best thing I saw this weekend, funny enough, was something I pulled out of the library on a whim. It's this movie that probably nobody's heard of called Dealing with Idiots. There we are. Like it was a graphic. Uh, it stars. It's only like a, it's not even a year old. It stars uh, and written, directed, and starring uh, Jeff Garland, who people might know from Curb Your Enthusiasm on HBO. He plays on that show. He plays Larry David's manager and like best friend. And it's this this little indie comedy about a guy whose kid plays little league, and he realizes that everybody, all the parents and the people who run this little league, are just are idiots and strange and nuts. So he decides to interview all them for a potential movie, but basically it's just an excuse to talk to all these people. And I laughed out loud consistently through the whole thing. Um, it's, it's a very indie kind of movie, so it, it's, you recognize just about everybody in it. You've got Fred Willard, J.B. Smoove, Bob Odekirk, Kerry Kenny Silver, Gina Gershon, Jamie Gertz, and more. And uh, it's a great ensemble comedy. It's certainly at your local video store. I happened to get it from the library because I was in there, but I'm sure Video Headquarters has it. And uh, it was just consistently funny. And it was more entertaining than anything else I saw this weekend. So I would have to say, if you're in video headquarters and they happen to have dealing with idiots, it's probably better than a lot of the high profile comedies uh, with their certain preoccupations and fixations than you'll, you'll normally see. And uh, despite a lot of language, it's not really terribly offensive. Uh, it was just really funny and nutty. Uh, having said that, some other things to clear clear off the docket here while Tom's not here. Um, if you like old movies like I like old movies, uh, you may be aware if you're in the Boston area, New England area, I know this show goes out other places too, and, and if it, you're watching in one of those other areas, I'll make you jealous. The Somerville Theater, great old movie palace down there that shows uh, a lot of retro, off the beaten path kind of older classics and things on film when they can. Uh, on Saturday, July 26th, they are doing a Don Knotts double feature. Uh, which is stuff that I grew up with on Boston TV. They're running 35 millimeter prints, and if I know them, they'll look gorgeous, of The Ghost of Mr. Chicken and The Incredible Mr. Limpet. And it's 10 bucks, and it starts at 10 a.m., so it's not a major time commitment. That's where I'm gonna be next Saturday. So if uh, we have time in next week's show, I'll probably talk about what that experience was like. But I just think that's really cool that they're doing that, and I think folks should support that sort of thing because too, too often when theaters show old movies, they just show the same five old movies that everybody shows. Like you can throw a rock and hit a theater that's showing Jaws or Gone with the Wind or whatever. But Ghost of Mr. Chicken is kind of rare, especially on film. A lot of theaters tend to just run a Blu-ray or a DVD, which I think is, I think it's kind of lazy and the cheap way to go because these are video formats that are intended for your home TV, not for a TV, you know, this, not for a screen the size of a football field. Uh, film still looks better if it's a good print. Um, also, if you like what we do here, if you like what I do here, uh, some friends and I do a podcast called The Film Basement, and we have a website called thefilmbasement.com that will link you to the podcast that we do. Um, and it is five people who have loved film all their lives and have worked in various levels of the industry. One, a, uh, an Emmy-nominated 
film director, actually, for TV. Uh, some sorry, film editor, an Emmy-nominated TV editor who edits. Yes. Uh, so we talk about genres usually or themes, and we've done about uh, about a half dozen shows, six to eight shows so far. It's on iTunes, and it's also on. Um, various other places on the web. So if you're interested in more lengthy, in-depth discussions about certain films than you get on this show, uh, they each run between like 50 and 90 minutes and uh, occasional cussing, but we try to keep that to a minimum. Anyway, that's all I have here. I could keep blabbering on and on, but if you're still watching, you're probably pretty close to changing the channel anyway. So uh, next week we have Hercules, a new take on the Hercules legend with The Rock, uh, which I'm really curious how that's going to play because to me it's like... How different is it from this from the Scorpion King? Uh, and then we also likely have Lucy, which is the new Scarlett Johansson film where she's uh, can't be can't be uh, can't be vanquished super agent action heroine. Uh, my biggest hope about this is that it's written by Luc Besson, who generally has a really good feel for pop cinema Hollywood fun kind of stuff. So it should be kind of cool. So uh, until then, uh, I will be sitting in this chair alone, waiting for Tom to return. I am Mark, and this was The Cinemaniacs.